And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, co-creator of the, up of the upcoming exploration into the strange and unknown through strange and unknown dice. Oh, better known as Shiver, the one and only Barney Menzies. How you doing? How you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm glad to hear there's an open bar. So that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a rarity in this in this day and age. I'm I'm fully aware. So I'll start off with the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. What will Talk to me about how you got into role playing games and what was it that made it stick for you? Sure. So, um, I sort of started playing, or I, I played games most of my life, but um, I got into tabletop games uh, through card games when I was a teenager. Um, and I, I, I'm quite a competitive person, so I ended up going to lots of like competitive uh, card game tournaments and eventually like miniature wargaming tournaments. Um, and I wanted to have an element of like my gaming hobby be something that I didn't take seriously, wasn't competing in any way. Um, and I had a friend who was really into um, tabletop role playing, and he kind of dragged me to a, a session. Was like, "Come on, you really enjoy this." Um, and uh, I've been hooked pretty much ever since on the role playing front, um, which is kind of how we got to this point. My brother is very similarly. Minded, he picked up uh, role playing games at university with some of his friends. Um, and Shiver was kind of born out of them trying to hack systems together to make a uh, make a game that they could play their favorite uh, terrible movie plots in um, because they were all at film school together. Mm -hmm. And so it's yeah. <laughs> now, when when you mentioned when you mentioned starting out with card games, um. Was one of them magic, and if there were if there were some that weren't that, what which ones were they? Yeah, so I played magic quite a lot, um, but I've also played um, some Pokemon, some of the WoW TCG back when that was a game, mm -hmm. and before it was replaced by Hearthstone. Um, but I, used, I, would, I had quite a lot of fun, um, sort of when I was a teenager and uh, when I started college, mm -hmm. um, going around Europe playing tournaments. Um, that's, that's kind of what got me into gaming. Um, Nottingham is is kind of a hub for uh, the games industry in the UK because it's where Games Workshop's based and there's a bunch of other games companies that are located here. So it's it's kind of a bit of a nexus for, for the tabletop world in, in, in England. Mm -hmm. And now with the, with the, with that in mind, how, um, how did the notion of um, Shiver really, really get started? Yeah, so I mean, my brother was looking at like putting together a bunch of systems and like hacking his own homebrews to play um, movie stories and like put uh, their scripts into like a gameplay form when he was at university. And he sort of came up with this basic system of how he thought you could maybe do that. Um, and one time when he was back home visiting, uh, he kind of showed me this thing that he put together on like scraps of paper of like mm -hmm. just basic ideas and basic mechanics. Um, and we started talking about it a bit more and um, sort of came to the conclusion that maybe it'd be a fun project to try and work this out into a, a fully fledged system um, for us to play with. Um, and like many things, it, it kind of escalated very quickly from there from just us writing it for um, our personal enjoyment to other people being interested in it and mm -hmm. kind of chatting with our friends and like, oh, like this would be great if you could re actually release this as a thing. Um, and then we had like an artist jump on board and it, it, it kind of just snowballed into um, the point at the beginning of this year um, when COVID hit and um, my brother and our artists had a bit more time on their hands that uh, we decided that we were just going to go for it and, and get it out there. 
um, which led to the Kickstarter that's gone live and has done, uh, by all accounts, uh, much better than we expected. It's been absolutely wonderful to put it in front of people and see people get so excited about it. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things I'm cu- one of the things I'm curious about when it comes to the mechanics of, of Shivers that you guys have elected to do something that um for some it for some is a very scub kind of th- kind of thing, um, and that and that is using cust- not only using custom dice but using symbol based dice. The reason I say it's <clears throat> um scub is because. Um, about a year ago, I did I did a review of um, the Star Wars FFG trilogy, and even to this day, I still get people commenting about how I did how about their uh, take on the symbol based dice that that game uses, and you guys are using sim- symbol based dice as well. And what I'm cu- what I'm curious about was what led you to go da- to go down the route of taking that approach instead of using numeric dice. Sure. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do with Shiver was make it um, really accessible for newer players and also um, try and remove some elements of um, other systems that we'd seen that break um, the immersion in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that we identified quite early was that dice mathematics um, and numerical dice didn't give the experience that we wanted like having a dice score that then you added a modifier to or having a dice result that you're looking for didn't really convey any any meaning it just felt like a mechanical element that supported what we want to do but didn't didn't really do do it justice Mm -hmm. um we we wanted to have the symbolic dice for sort of to keep players in the moment um and also to help get players or people who've maybe never played a uh, role-playing game to be more interested in it. And we had quite a lot of, um, my brother had a couple of friends at university who were not particularly great at mental arithmetic at all. Like they really struggled to do like basic sums on the fly. And for them, like that was like a big turn off for role-playing games that they've played to the point where they didn't really want to play them that much. And it was a, an interesting thing that I'd never really thought about. Cause obviously I'm like, like a lot of gamers like had, d- did quite well in maths at school and like doing basic arithmetic was not something I struggled with, but speaking to other gamers, it's, it did seem to actually be a problem. Um, the other element that we really liked for symbolic dice was the, the immersion element, like rather than looking for numbers, you're looking for symbols that correspond to a thing that you're actually doing, be it busting down a door with a, a grit, like physical skill, or like sneaking with a, uh, a wit dexterity skill, or just getting plain lucky um, with luck. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it kind of helps the immersion um, when making checks. Um, and then one thing that actually emerged from working with Symbolic Dice and thinking about how they interacted with the game was that we also got to escape from the binary success fail paradigm that you get with numerical dice where Mm -hmm. it maybe you've got like a even a boon and bust mechanic where you succeed with a an extra boon or you succeed with a a drawback or you fail with a boon and you fail with a drawback in shiver um the dice can aid in the role playing so if say for example you roll your pool and you're trying to take a really physical action, like kick down a door mm-hmm. and you, uh, you're you looking for grit symbols, which is our, our core skill for physical physical skills. Mm-hmm. Um, you roll your pool, you don't get any grit symbols. So you, you really fluffed it at trying to kick this door down, but you've rolled like almost all of your pool is uh, the yellow symbol for smarts. And maybe you uh, look down and see that it's a pool door or you see like a weakness in the door that you could maybe exploit. And it, it gives that, element to making the dice rolls that makes them feel important at all points in time mm-hmm. and with with that and with that particular thing in in mind i had also i've also seen that you get you guys have um each of the each of the attributes split into two values um 
one for one for the one for attribute and one for effectively um skip um skill um at, or rather skill and t rather in your case skill and um talent um <coughs> now for now first um narr narratively what would be the difference between between um skip between skill and talent and what would it denote if somebody was high in skill and low in talent and vice versa so skill is is a representation of like the the raw ability that a normal person would have mm -hmm. um so um kind of like if you think that a like strong guy would be really skilled uh in doing physical tasks but maybe they were really talented at say um wrestling um, and maybe they'd receive like a talent bonus um, that's kind of innately part of their character. Um, one thing that we wanted to distinguish with skill and talent is that um, when characters um, get afraid, uh, their their raw skill, their ability to sort of function at a basic level is reduced, but your their talent isn't affected in any way. So if a if a character is talented at picking locks, uh, even if they're afraid that innate talent shines through, uh, regardless of whatever's happening to their skills from from modifiers, um, the other difference between kind of skill and talent is um, the way the talent dice interacts with a couple of the archetypes, uh, mostly the weird archetype, because the talent dice is split into um, strange symbols, um, which are kind of like a failure symbol, but also they are a success symbol for characters that are engaging with the weird elements of stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then talent symbols, which are successes for um, everything else, for all of the other core skills. And the idea is that um, characters can be talented in everything apart from strange, which is kind of an innate ability. All right. Um, what would what would be what would be when it comes to the values for um, skill and talent? What would be the baseline normal? Would that be um, two, two and two and one, or would it go a little bit higher? So it's, it's the the average Joe, which is like the stat line for a, your your basic bod human, is threes across the board, um, which which puts uh, like your average person at like just under 50, 50 to succeed mm -hmm. uh, in a check to kind of have this idea that the, in a, in a general sense that most people are slightly more likely to fail at a difficult task than they are to succeed at it. Um, but then obviously you have character specializations that increase those skills for, for, for people who are good at certain abilities. And when it now, when it comes to when it comes to the setup that you get that you guys have as far as the as far as the style of play that it's going for, um, would it be fair of me to say that you're not really concerned with a particular genre of storytelling, but more of ju just um just maintaining the feel of horror and the um and the weird. Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to because horror is such a broad genre. Because you're, you're you're playing with elements of sci-fi, you're playing you can play with elements of fantasy. You can play in in a world setting. We wanted to provide a, a a broad narrative sandbox and a mechanical sandbox for players to pick and choose um, how they use the system to make sure that we gave access to for people to be able to play whatever sort of narrative version of horror they wanted to play, mm -hmm. whether that be sort of mystery adventure, Scooby-Doo style stories to like intense, like horror puzzle saw kind of stories, or just like hack and slash, like zombie horde tool up and smash through some enemies kind of games. Like it's, it's it's designed so that you can take your favorite elements from your favorite films and, and bring them into in onto the tabletop. And 
taking and taking that in taking that into account, the other the other um, thing that I noticed is now I've I've seen my fair share of um of hor of horror based games, and a lot of times because of the fact that they're trying to replicate something a little more contemporary, they tend to n they tend to go um class based, but you have introduced um archetypes, which isn't necessarily a class per se, but it, it but it is class adjacent. You know, much much like some, much like how somebody might say, "Well, we're not in hell, but we are in hell adjacent." <laughs> um, so when it comes to when it comes to the class, when it comes to the um, archetype setup that you have, and the fact that you're using a level system, what can you tell me about how about how that works? I mean, there was the um, image of the weird skill tree in the uh, Kickstarter page, but what can you tell me about the archetypes and the way that relates to levels? Sure. So when we, um, when we were designing um, sort of the, the, the game itself, mm -hmm. we, we were trying to work out how you got that breadth of genres and how you designed so that um, the characters that you would build would be able to fit into genres that were as wide ranging from like aliens and laser beams to swords and shields and bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we worked out was that if you take uh, a character archetype, the kind of essence of a character that you would find in any story, be it like your big burly physical warrior to your death spy or, or sort of roguey character, or even your like intelligent wizard or medic or surgeon kind of character these the these sort of archetypal characters exist in every genre and so it was all about designing um abilities and flavor behind the characters that um allowed them to be represented in any type of story in terms of the sort of character creation um process the first thing you do is you, you pick an archetype. Um, there's seven in the game, six of which are pretty much directly attached to the core skills, uh, which are grit, which is your physical physical characters, wit, which is your sort of mental and physical dexterity, um, heart, which is your uh, charisma, but also like your intimidation, your ability to handle people, but also your, your sort of oratory skill. Um, smarts, which is sort of raw intellectual power. Luck, which is uh, pretty self-explanatory, really, is, is how lucky your character is. And then Strange, which is how attuned to the uh, sort of strange elements of the story the character is, but also um, how resistant they are to the effects of fear um, as well. So there's there's six archetypes based on those core skills, and then there's a seventh archetype which we added as a um, kind of homage to the horror genre, which is the survivor, which is your kind of best of all bits, but also weaknesses in other areas. So you get a little bit of benefit in a lot of areas, but you get a lot of downsides in others. So it's it's kind of a little bit min maxi. Uh, in its archetype, but it's it's designed to represent those characters that you get in horror movies that are like at the end of the movie, everybody else is dead and they're they're sort of gritting their teeth and powering through because they're just about scraping by um, through every kind of challenge. So you, you pick your archetype from from those, um, and each of those archetypes has a skill tree, um, which depending on the ability level that you're playing at. Um, will determine what abilities they can take from their tree because it's kind of a, a point by system with a skill tree that allows you to explore it based on where you've put your points and whether you have skill uh, abilities that link to other abilities. Um, so you, you put your points in the tree uh, and you, either, you can either go up one specific tree mm -hmm. to get to abilities that are more specific and tailored to a, a, a certain type of character style or you can spread them out to make a sort of broader character that maybe has less powerful abilities, but is able to do more things um, than, than a more specific character. Um, once you've done that process, that's kind of your, like, your meat and potatoes of the character. Like, like, what are they? What are they good at? What kind of abilities do they have? 
You combine that with a background, um, which are where you get your real flavor. They're the, you get a special ability and a special flaw that's tied in with a specific background that you might find in a story. So for example, uh, one of them is the priest, uh, and the priest has an ability uh, where he gets to make a thunderous sermon uh, and inspire inspire his allies. Uh, but his downside is that uh, he's a God-fearing man and uh, he, it's, it's, he fears the supernatural. So when dealing with uh, enemies of a supernatural nature, um, he has to, has to pass a fear check in order to, to keep his nerve. Um, you get your background. Once you've got your background and your archetype, you slam those two together and getting a sort of fully formed character at this point. And then the last step is to add a fear. Um, and the fear was something that we really wanted to add on as a uh, a mechanic within the horror game, because obviously it's, it's important for characters to have drawbacks and fears to add to that level of experience and tension in the game. So having a, having a fear um, like the dark or blood or uh, specific animals um, makes the, the gameplay really interesting because suddenly a character that's doing really well might run into something that scares them outside of the situation they've fallen into um, and it provides like a really nice role-playing um, element as well. Yeah. Now, when it, when it comes to the... When it comes to the skill... Tr when it comes to the um, skill trees... Because... Um, <clears throat> because... Obviously, I'm seeing. Obviously, them seeing that it's in a very um, pattern like a, um, not pattern, but um, line line like approach w in the image given. Um, what would it be a case where where it'd be a, where um, people would have to go down a have to go down a singular path, or could they, di or could they diverge if they want to broaden their net? Yeah, absolutely. So you can you can diverge within a specific tree. Um, so um, the trees, for the most part, have three different paths, um, each um, corresponding to like a different style of how the archetype is represented in stories. So the warrior archetype, for example, has a path that is the protector, um, a path that is like a, a bruisery brawler, uh, and then a, a path that's kind of like a middle ground fighter kind of best of both worlds a little bit of a leader like your, your standard like strong character and you can build your characters to be like all the way up that protector path so that your character's all about having abilities that help them defend um their allies but maybe you can take uh the rage ability from the barbarian uh part of the path which which gives you a uh, a bonus so that when uh, enemies hit you, maybe you, you get filled with rage and you get a bit more powerful. Mm. Um, there's also um, rules in the full book, uh, which we haven't actually yet revealed, for hybridizing archetypes together so that you can pull skills from other trees. Um, this mixes quite nicely with some other drawbacks about um, adding additional flaws and kind of playing with the idea that more complex characters have drawbacks as well as benefits. So if you're multi-classing or multi-archetyping, um, we call it hybridizing in Shiver, mm -hmm. um, if you want to be a, a warrior that's also a scholar, then uh, maybe that comes with a downside, a fatal flaw is what we call them, um, that makes your character ha uh, more complex and, 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 and more interesting to role play with. Um, now, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the entry when it comes to the entry for e for each um for each archetype, do you do you guys did you guys plan on putting in a um not not a full not a full paragraph thing, but just a little aside about what what ex what examples in fiction um would qualify at, would qualify as each archetype. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just scrolling through the full book right now to mm -hmm. see what it's written in that section because I'm. It's been a while since I've proofread it. Yeah, absolutely. So we're at the start of each um, each section for each of the archetypes, we've got a bit about um, what that archetype represents. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about like the the different um, kinds of characters that inspire 
um, each of the ability trees um, before getting into the, the abilities more broadly. Um, one thing that we'll also be doing is um, when we're releasing some of our sort of story campaign um, books, we'll have example characters in there of like the kind of character you could play with that archetype in this story. So we always we felt that that's that's a really nice jumping off point for people coming to play a story. Is like, oh well, here's the kind of characters that could exist in this story or this world. Um, maybe I want to play something like that or it gives me a nice reference point to what I could play. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now, um, this brings me, this brings me to, the, to, the, to the question of the Doom Clock. Um, and when it, when it comes to... First off, how did was the Doom Clock something that you guys had in mind early on, or was it something that you developed as you as you were as the game was taking shape? So the, the, I, it was definitely something that emerged. We we had this idea that we wanted to have a, a pacing mechanic in the game mm -hmm. because um, one thing that we found was if you if you kind of just put players. Uh, in a situation with no restrictions and no consequences, um, they'll take a lot of time and be really methodical and try and try and um, almost game the story. Um, you'll have players rolling a load of checks to try and sneak. Uh, we'll spend loads of time like trying to bandage each other up and pick locks and going about it really carefully. And we found that it it just kills that tension um, that horror stories should have. Um, so what we wanted to do was kind of work in a mechanic that drove that tension and that narrative structure um, whilst also um, combining with like the role playing element and the dice rolling element so that when players uh, failed a roll, it had a consequence and it, ha it, it felt like something bad had happened. Um, so the doom clock... Uh, Every time a player fails a check and they roll a strange, uh, for each strange symbol they roll, the doom clock ticks up. Um, and then when you hit quarter past, half past, quarter two and midnight on the doom clock, so 15, 30, 45, and 60, um, a doom event happens. And these are kind of like big, splashy narrative events that happen in the story as a result of the player's uh, like either kind of destabilizing the game world or making bad decisions um, that have consequences. So a quarter past, like perhaps the lights go out, the power the power gets cut in the the facility that they're exploring. At half past, um, an NPC that's guiding them meets a grisly end at the hands of a of a bad guy. Um, at quarter to, um, maybe the bad guy jumps out breaks a leg of one of the party or like does something equally gruesome. And then at midnight, it's uh, all guns blazing. Uh, things are getting really, really bad. Um, and something awful is going to happen to to the, the party. And it's it provides that tension. And it, it provides also that really, really nice um, kind of role playing experience where you're getting to like 14 minutes and you're one minute away and players are thinking like, oh, do I want to like make a check and roll here and risk failing? Or do I want to, want to, want to hold off and maybe take another route? Yeah. And when it, now I can, I can easily, I can easily see this, be, this being integrated with, um, with campaigns that would have some sort of creature feature, especially um, given the popularity of video games like dead by daylight these days. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, but how, how would you, how would you, uh, propose using the, do, using the, um, Doom Clock in a, in a campaign that is aiming a little more for suspense than aiming for some sort of slasher villain? Sure. So, I mean, um, one example, uh, like the power going out is quite a nice one because it's, it's atmosphere and environmental um, effects that you can apply to quite a few stories. Um, you can have um, it affect the way that um, players engage with enemies. So perhaps um, 
you've got a combat encounter that players are moving towards and perhaps rather than them stumbling upon it in a uh, a more covert fashion, perhaps the monsters get the jump on them in a collective. Um, we've had uh, players, for example, moving through a, an office, trying to be quiet to not attract a zombie horde. Uh, maybe a player makes a check and rolls a strange and ticks the doom clock up to an event um, and they make a clattering sound and suddenly the zombie horde's chasing them. So you, you can kind of get really creative with it. And what, what we kind of suggest to directors for the game is that you have some kind of pre-prepared narrative structure events, but also to kind of take it on the fly as well and, and make it make it feel like the event is part of the, the role that's gone bad. Um, it can also be things like, the players maybe know that they're going towards an objective. Maybe they're trying to get to um, a radio tower to signal for help outside of where they are. Um, And they, just as they get to the radio tower, um, maybe like a few minutes before they've reached a doom event and you you say that they've got a shiver down their spine and they know that something bad's about to happen. And as they get to the radio tower, it's struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's quite a lot of play that you can have with it um, as as a narrative mechanic. Um, now, I've often remarked that games ne- that games need some sort of extra effort uh, mechanic. You look at you look at a lot of games, and you'll see something along that lines. Um, Shadowrun has Edge, World of Darkness has Willpower, so, so on and so forth. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that Shiver's example of this is the Luck Bank, and what. What I'm curious about is with um with l- with um with luck is it is it a case where it's mi- where it's mainly adding an additional skill skill die to a roll or are there other uses for luck? So yeah, the the, the luck mechanic kind of was born out of um because there's a for the skills that players are maybe necess- the characters are not necessarily as adept in. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a relative where well, there's a higher chance of failure than there is success on a normal check. So one way we kind of wanted to mitigate that was if you roll a, uh, a check and you get a luck symbol in your pool, um, you get to bank a luck point to spend later on on another check, and that gives you an extra skill die, and that's kind of the basic. Um, boon bust mechanic, but built in as like the ebb and flow of luck in the story in that, sure, you're failing here, but maybe you'll get lucky later. Um, But then the archetype that really plays with luck as a mechanic is the fool. So uh, normal characters can bank one luck point um, and their way of using it is they can add add a dice to their pool spending, spending that luck point, or if they roll two luck symbols in one check, they can choose to expend them to either have a generic success or they can tick the doom clock back by one and try and manage the manage the sort of impending doom that's following them. Mm-hmm. Fool, on the other hand, can bank up to three points of luck and then can spend them in interesting ways. Um, you've got uh, abilities that heal allies. You've got abilities that dish out luck points to do various things. Um, and it's it's all about having characters that are, I mean, it's the characters that appear in movies that are fortunate and they're surviving, but you have absolutely no idea how they're doing it. Um, and it's playing with like, oh, well, maybe they're blessed by a god. Maybe they're just just absolutely oblivious to what's going on and, 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 and playing with that idea. For whatever reason, the man who knew too little is coming to mind. I don't know why. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um but what I do find interesting with that is that even, even with the even with the um, option of playing as the fool, the luck bank is still relatively small compared to other extra effort um, systems potentially. I'm, and that's not and I'm not bringing that up as a criticism. I actually approve of that because when you have that sort of limited resource, you ha- you ha- you can have a problem that I've come to nickname. The um, invisible rainy day, you know, where somebody's hoard- where somebody's hoarding that particular um, resource for when they think they're gonna really need it, even if that day never comes. And then the end of the campaign comes around; they've got a full, 
they've got a full pool of that resource that they didn't use because they thought, oh, something bigger was going to be around the corner. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you also have the other end of the problem where um, players are constantly pushing roles and and really going over the edge with it, um, which means that when they get to a, a bigger threat where they should have been saving that resource for, maybe they, they, they're going to struggle. Um, we did we did have like uh, we do have some elements of that in some of the skills, uh, sorry, some of the abilities, um, in that there are abilities that are maybe more powerful that come with downsides. But we didn't want to bake in that um, uh, effort as a cost for a benefit, just as a basic mechanic. We wanted characters to have the wheelhouse that they start with. And then maybe they have a couple of elements like that in their toolkit that they can use. Um, we wanted to do it in ways like having use limits on abilities or um, for the the, um, the weird character, um, if you're using uh, powers that are sort of destabilizing, maybe the hits so like the blood magic ability, for example, uh, costs wounds as well as making rolls to use and having like those kind of decisions mm -hmm. um, and the decisions based around whether or not you want to risk ticking up the doom clock were the kind of um, management decisions we wanted to have within uh, within decision trees for players rather than the, oh, do I push this role? Do I maybe hold back um, and, and kind of and kind of exploring it that way instead? Yeah. Um, and when it comes to the when it comes to the archetypes, one other thing that I can see um, getting avoided is the notion of a of a certain archetype being the skill monkey or so or something like that basically the rogue problem um because because un unless i'm mistaken um all all um skills slash abilities that are gr that are granted from ar from um archetypes are are root are rooted in that there isn't a skill subsystem within sh within shiver where one where um one would have where one would have that part that particular um advantage like how like how rogues and in, in some fantasy games have all have all the um dexterity based skills and and um everybody else is se as seen as a numpty when it comes when it comes to using those skills because they don't have because they're not as good as the rogue yeah, absolutely. You you don't have the 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 problem like that. the The whole idea behind uh, behind the archetype system is that characters should kind of play to type. In mm -hmm. that your your gritty character should do physical gritty things. Your lucky character should aim to get lucky. Your weird character should do weird things. And it's all about playing to type like that. But What's interesting about Shiver is that there's not such a gaping void between a character that is really talented in an area to a character that is completely terrible in an area. Like the there's there's still a chance of success, especially with the luck mechanic of mm -hmm. of, a, of a character doing basic feats. So you don't have that problem where. Um, Everyone's trying to pick the lock, and nobody can do it apart from the rogue. Because realistically, your average character with a bit of luck will probably succeed that check because it's not that difficult to do. And it's only when you're doing che making checks that are much more complicated or much more difficult, um, like trying to crack open a safe or uh, bust down a reinforced door or um, hack into a, a complicated computer system that each of the archetypes really shines in. Okay, this is my thing that I'm really good at. And like, you guys can try it, but you're probably going to tick up the doom clock more likely than you are to pass. So just leave this to me. Yeah. Given, given that, um, is, there a is there a certain party size that you'd say Shiver favors in terms of how many people at the table... Um, it would favor more than more than others, because obviously, ha obviously having a having a table with all of the arc with one player playing all of the archetypes would be pushing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I I think we have played games like that. Um, 
I, I think generally um, for role-playing games, I, I tend to not run in anything with more than six players just because if, if you're playing a, a, like a, a few hour long session, it just means that each player is going to get enough time to develop their character and, and, and engage with the game. Mm-hmm. Um, once you start getting to like seven, eight, nine players, it just becomes messy and people are sat out not doing anything and then you like start losing that immersion. Um, I'd, I'd say probably th- so three to five players is, is tends to be where we like to sit for running it because you you get loads of engagement from the characters and um, you, you have that constant sense of immersion because even if one character's off doing something by themselves, two other characters are having another scene and you, you kind of you kind of keep that narrative throughput going and keep keep people in the game because the the last thing you want with horror is is for people to start like losing interest being on their phones and you, you, you're not going to get that level of tension or that level of intrigue mm-hmm. and what now per, personally my mad my magic number that i that i rely on for uh, party size has always been four um it's the goal it's for lack of a better term it's the goldilocks number not yeah. too many, not too few, just enough. Um, but when it when now, given the fact that Shiver isn't really trying to emulate a particular um, time period, I'm guessing that 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 this is reflected in um, in the sections for inventory and um, just general kit. Where there's gonna be some, there's gonna be stuff. If somebody wanted to do something a little more futuristic, if somebody wanted to do something a little more anachronistic, and so on. Especially since one concept that I don't think is done enough is horror fantasy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Or, yeah, it's it's it's, it's 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 definitely not explored a huge amount. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been there's been a few dark fantasy R- RPGs o- over the years, chief. One of the bigger ones, of course, being Shadow of the Demon Lord. But when it comes, but when it comes to doing an outright horror story like you'd like you'd see in a slasher, um, I do think that there's the potential to do to do that because it's not like there's it's not like there's a lack of creature features in fairy tales, anyways, especially fairy tales in Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's uh, the the kind of gothic uh, fantasy is is a. Uh... Is an area that we've played a decent amount and um one of our stretch goals uh kind of plays with that like folklore horror um in sort of fairy um folklore admittedly that one is set in sort of a more recent like 20s period um but we have written some other stuff as well that is more um more geared towards like how terrifying some fantasy monsters are like goblins are scary and so are so are dragons in in reality so like it's nice to have like these really powerful fantasy characters that are here to slay the dragon but kind of turning that on its head where the dragon's probably going to slay you is 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 interesting as well yeah um and when it co- when it comes to the other the other concept that came, that came to mind especially since the art especially given the art for the survivor archetype is the fact that there's a myriad of um, folk tales when it comes to the American Old West, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there's a few campaigns in, in just in just in some of those tales that could be done. Yeah, absolutely, we've we've uh, we had a we recently had a map of um, all of the cryptids that are related to each uh, state in the united states and that was quite interesting looking at the the folklore and the the monsters that are baked into the stories of 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 the usa and but yeah the wild west is a a really interesting um sort of area to explore as well i know that dark prospects which is a stretch goal one of the stretch goals we unlocked that's gone into the book kind of explores the 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 frontier kind of setting um looking at like how creepy things like uh like desert towns and mining complexes and things like that are mm-hmm. um and the reason the reason i the reason 
I'm focusing on the on these sort of aspects is I could I could see it becoming very tempting of some of something like Shiver to be to be run in the way in the way a um, in the way a slasher would would be run like say chill chill's not exactly a slasher but it but I think you can see where I'm going with this um when it's when it sound when it sounds like what you guys have in mind it has a much broader net than just that yeah absolutely we we want to encourage people to really play the play the stories that they want to play with shiver mm -hmm. and what we aim to do with the book is not only provide the toolbox of items and enemies and kind of like setting ideas and story ideas um, for players to to actually generate their own stories but we also want to provide that um, initial um, sort of plethora of settings for people to really explore which is what we're doing with the the second book in the kickstarter which has our folk horror our zombie horror our um weird west horror our, our sci-fi horror and it's 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 almost a um, an educational process for us because i know that initially when i first started on the project i was i was not sure about how we were going to convey horror as 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 this kind of broad thing in the game um and it, it, we wanted to kind of show that maybe you think you don't like horror but actually these stories that you really like like scooby-doo or um the x-files or things like that are horror in their essence it's just that they're not as scary and they play with the mystery element of horror or the exploration element of horror or the unknown and it's mm -hmm. it's it, i'm really interested to see what players come up with and what players are, are really excited to explore with it yeah and now one of the other one of the other things that I noticed that you get that you guys are made a point to bring up is is the um, stuff you're doing for remote play help. Now we are I, I already mentioned the dice roller app, which I which um which I think which I approve of, especially 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 given how I mentioned that symbol based dice is a very scub topic for a lot of people. Um. Now when it now. When it comes to the in, when it comes to the inclusion of interactive um, character sheet PDFs, I'm guess I'm guessing that that's me, that that's meant to just be um fill just fillable character sheets, and is the same is the same thing applicable when it comes to the Doom Clock, of the the interactive Doom Clock that you guys have planned. Yeah, so we, we've we've obviously got that dice roller up, and that yeah, as as you as you kind of mentioned, that was one of the one of the driving forces for getting that app together was that we knew that symbolic dice are a, a kind of divisive topic mm -hmm. um, in role-playing games, and we wanted to basically show our intention that the, the reason we're using these symbolic dice is because we think it makes the gameplay experience better, not because we want to sell people lots of dice. Um, and so by having that app available and free for people to use, we, we kind of wanted to show that. Mm -hmm. Also... If people turn up to their physical session of role play in the future and they've forgotten their dice, it means that they can still play because that's that that was a, a big thing for us that we wanted to have. Yeah. Um, the the PDF um, character sheets are, are fillable fillable character sheets. Uh, on that character sheet as well is a um, a a form fillable doom clock with like checkpoints on it that lets you count up um, towards towards where you're going. Um, we're planning on looking at doing some integration as well into um, into apps like Roll Twenty and, and other um, online platforms as well, so that people can can have character sheets and Doom Clock trackers and custom dice on there as well. Um, we've we've just got to get our developers organised on that front because it's it's a bit more complicated than just yeah. putting out the EDFs ourselves. Yeah, obviously, and having having to mess with API, which um. It, you can do a lot of amazing things, but sometimes it's like pulling teeth. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and with that, with that in with that in mind, um, now the Kickstarter at the time of this recording has eleven days to go. Um, I uh, there is a small part of me that ho that hopes that the total amount of backers when it's done ends up being six hundred and sixty six because <laughs> I'm not sure like that. 
but what but um once it get once it gets finished um in December what would what would you say you're shoot what would you say you're shooting for as far as a release window so our plan is to have um PDF content for the main book out by March next year um that's just going to give us enough time to uh, get the final art uh, pieces that aren't finished yet done, um, and also just lots and lots and lots of proofreading to make sure it's 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 makes sense as much as we can possibly make sense um, uh, for everyone. And then the plan is to have the full release of all of the physical products in hands of people by August next year, so that everyone's got it in hand and plenty of time to read it before they want to run their scary games on Halloween. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or, or scary slash kitsch because, well, a bunch of people at my table are, are big, are big fans of Evil Dead. So I could see them talking me into running that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. We, we look like that's, that's kind of the horror that I really love is like that kitsch horror, but also like slightly silly. I love films like The Mummy and like it's films that kind of take the scary element and poke fun at it as well as it being scary. Mm hmm. Um, I'm just I'm just not gonna allow anybody anybody to do the to do the whole chainsaw arm thing. At least not at least not <laughs> at least not until I've got comfortable enough with the rule set that I that I um know where where I want to hack it. <laughs> I've got the rules for a chainsaw and I've got the rules for an arm. What's the, where does this <laughs> where does this sit? <laughs> well, it's 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 just one it's just one of those things where you have to understand the rules before you can try and break them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I do, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, ha I wouldn't want to have the idea of a chainsaw arm, um, not eat, um, step on, step onto the toes of, um, of cer of certain archetypes or certain abil or certain abilities. Yeah. But, give, but given that, given that, um. What do you what do you what would you say you're shooting for as far as the page size of the core book? Um, so it's it's looking at sitting around the 200 page mark. Um, we're currently actually adding some extra bits to the book um, that we were unsure about whether we wanted to have in it um, because one of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that we didn't have too much complexity in the book because um, we're aware that. Um, obviously, if we're designing this game for um, entry-level RPG players as well as experienced role players, that we don't want to provide like this huge doorstopper of a book that's going to be like, oh my god, how am I ever going to read all of that? Um, so we wanted to make sure that we don't keep don't make it too dense, but equally we want there to be enough meat in it for for, for experienced uh, role players to really dig their teeth in. Mm -hmm. So we're currently playing around with where certain content's going to lie, um, but I imagine it's probably going to finish o over two hundred pages, um, and then the the other book will be up around the same, maybe slightly smaller. Um, so it's got it's going to have a fair whack of content in it. And I'll be I'll be keeping a very close eye on how on how it develops because well I'm always looking for new ways to hor to horrify my players because that's what you do as a GM. If it, is, are you ri are you really being a good GM if your players aren't paranoid of every time you roll the dice behind that screen? <laughs> I actually uh, I actually did an interview with. Um somebody yesterday who was saying that uh, they really love the doom clock because they uh, quite often just got an hourglass out uh, and put it in front of their players without telling them what it was for. And I was like, that's amazing levels of like messing with your players' minds. Well, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you're as guilty of this as, as I am of just, of just rolling dice behind the screen and, and everybody looking at you like you're like you're do like you're rolling damage or something. And you just rolled it just because you felt like it. Yeah, absolutely. I've done that. I've done that way too many times. <laughs> yeah, but with with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. <laughs> it's, it's been great. The, the open bar's been wonderful. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. 
as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thanks very much for having me. I've had, a, had an absolute blast talking about shit with you, so... And of, much. Yep. and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>